I'm uh, Ludovic Orlando. I'm professor of molecular archaeology at the uh, Center for Geogenetics, which is located at the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm here to talk about a paper that we are releasing in the journal Science. So the study is about a uh, horse and how we humans developed our relationship with horses during history. So we know that horses are perhaps the most important uh, domestic animal in the planet because they literally change history. For example, think about Genghis Khan, he was a horse rider. Think about the Roman Empire, of course, there was cavalry. And, and think about Alexander the Great, he conquered the world really uh, riding horses. So clearly, history will not be the same without horses. And in our project, what we undertake is to try to understand how horses have become a historical force and how we humans have engineered the horse to make it look like or do whatever we wanted the horse to do for us. So in that specific study, we were focusing mostly on one uh, uh, population of uh, horses that was living during the Iron Age in Kazakhstan and close to the Altai and the Tuva Republic of today. Um, and those people and horses, they were living, say, 2.5 thousands of years ago. We took that population because the people back then, they were mastering the horse, really, like almost no one was mastering the horse by then. There were warriors uh, mounting horses. They were able to shoot arrows with their composite bows while riding. And so we wanted to understand whether those people managed to engineer a new type of horse or was it just a sort of regular horse they, 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 they were riding. The approach we used was to uh, sequence the genome of the horses of that population. Uh, and for that we use like state-of-the-art methods in ancient DNA research. So by sequencing the genomes of 13 of those horses, uh, plus one which was a little bit older, actually coming from a uh, earlier culture of horse masters, if I may say so, we can use this data to understand better the process of horse domestication and beyond horse domestication, the process of animal domestication as a whole. One first hypothesis that we wanted to test is uh, specifically uh, tailored to horses because if you look at the horse diversity today, especially in stallions, they all have the same Y chromosome. So it looks like they all have been feathered by the same specific stallion back in the day. So horse domestication was easy. One stallion, so to speak, was actually at the origin of the whole stock of the animals. If that was true, then the Scythian horses should all have the same Y chromosome. And what we found is that they didn't. So clearly, 2.5 thousands of years ago, there was a huge Y chromosome diversity in horses, meaning that in the last 2.5 thousands of years, we lost a lot of this diversity. So, but beyond the horse, uh, our dataset could be used to test a series of hypotheses that are related to domestication as a whole, not just the process of horse domestication, but the process of animal domestication. So uh, one of the puzzles for evolutionary biologists such as us is how come that we can see the same types of characters or traits always being selected in different domesticates. For example, dogs, they have floppy ears or different types of colors, and so do horses, and so do other animals that have been domesticated. This is very puzzling to see how come independent processes will always end up with the same outcomes. And there is this model which is called the neural crest hypothesis, which basically says that there is one specific type of, of cells during development that will differentiate in a lot of things that are related to those domesticated traits. So if you change this population of cells and the way it behaves during development, then probably you will all in one go change the whole uh, types of traits that those cells and tissue will produce. So if we found in our data set evidence for selection on genes involved in the way this uh, cell population works, then we will support this hypothesis. And this is precisely what we found. 
example. Similarly, uh, we could use our data set to test another hypothesis which is worth for the process of animal domestication as a whole. And namely, this hypothesis is called the uh, cost of domestication hypothesis. And it simply says that because you do not domesticate the whole planet at once, you will have to domesticate a smaller subset of individuals to start with and to get started with the domestication process. Then because of this, some bad mutations, some mutations that will make you sick or some mutation that will diminish your capacity to reproduce or to even survive, they will invade your genome down the road. Because simply with small numbers, selection is not really efficient into purging out those mutations from the population. So if that model was right, then that means that the Scythian horses, which lived 3,000 years after the domestication of the horse even started, they should already have been invaded by such mutations. And we found very much the contrary. They were not invaded as much as our modern horse genomes are invaded. So that means that the cost of domestication hypothesis is not totally true. Yes, indeed, it's true in the way that uh, their genomes have been invaded by nasty mutations, if you want, but it didn't come with the beginning of horse domestication. This is something that took place much later, namely in the last 2.5 thousands of years in the case of the horse. What we found looking at one population of ancient horses, the Scythian horses, is already amazing. Imagine now what we can find when we will be looking at other types of horse populations in the past. Those from the Roman Empire, those from uh, Genghis Khan Empire, those from Alexander the Great or the Persians. Now we will have a very neat opportunity to understand how the human-horse relationship developed during history and what were the genetic changes that helped the horse become this historical force. And this is precisely what I'm happy doing now by running this ERC project named Pegasus that I started back in December.